In this video we want to talk about market regulation. We want to look at the reasons why governments feel it necessary to intervene in the running or the operation of a capitalist system. Why doesn't the government simply leave it to market forces? Leave it to the forces of supply and demand to determine prices, employment and all of the other factors or, or outcomes uh, we, we consider necessary from a good economic system. The provision of housing, clothing, food, uh, luxury items at prices we can afford. So why does the government feel it necessary to intervene? And that's what we're going to look at in this session. Now right from the outset I have to say that it is a controversial area and many economists disagree uh, over whether the government should intervene or not or, and also in the areas in which it, it in fact does get involved. Uh, should the government be involved with particular industries or particular sectors of the economy? So it is quite controversial and it is hotly debated in the press. So we start, why regulate? Well the first reason why we may want to regulate is related to the provision of public goods. Public goods have two attributes and this is the subject matter of another video on the course but public goods have two attributes they are uh, non-excludable and non-rival. So they have these two characteristics that we're not rivals for the public good and it's difficult to exclude us. Take for an example the defence force. Well it's difficult for you to exclude me from receiving the benefits of the defence force because once it's provided it's provided equally for everybody. It, it's there, it's almost there whether we like it or not. It's provided and it exists and we all benefit from it whether we we consider it benefit or not. Some people may be pacifists for example and don't want the, the defence forces but they can't reject it, it's there. And we're also not rivals. Uh, the more of us that live in the country uh, it simply means we, we are not rivals for the defence forces, the defence forces exists for all of us. So public goods have these characteristics. Now there is a problem about the provision of public goods. Uh, how should they be provided? Well it, the market doesn't really work here because there is a problem that uh, the defence forces exist to protect the country so therefore they don't raise revenue unless of course we hire them all, uh, out to other countries but we don't do that, they're, they're there to protect this country. So they don't raise a revenue, so how should they be financed? Well if we were to ask for voluntary contributions we may hit a problem called the free rider problem. For example, uh, let's say people came looking for money uh, asking you for a donation so we could have a defence force and let's say you really wanted a defence force, you, you liked the idea of a defence force but you could tell lies, you could say actually you don't believe in defence forces and you would do that thinking that other people will contribute and if the defence forces are then supplied you've become what's known as a free rider, you've misrepresented your preferences in effect you've lied. So what you've done is you've got the provision of the defence forces but you didn't pay for it. You become a free rider. And to avoid the free rider issue governments tax us. They impose a compulsory tax on the people perhaps related to work or to uh, capital gains or death duty or whatever it is. So they, they impose a tax and then out of the tax they provide the defence forces. So the government gets involved to ensure that the public goods are being provided. There are also uh, areas called externalities considered to be areas of market failure as well. 
Um, in this case, uh, an externality is simply a non-traded interdependence. It's an interdependence that's not traded. So sometimes we're interdependent in terms of production, for example. One company uh, may use, let's say, water from a river to make its product, but it puts the water back into the river polluted. And then a company further along the river, who also needs water, will only get polluted water. The two companies are connected in a sense. There's an interdependence between them, but the first company does not compensate the second one. The second one has to clean the water before he can use it. The second company may be a brewery making beer, so it needs clean water. The first one uh, is making paper, so it may pollute the water. So we have externalities, but externalities can be positive as well. For example, education. Uh, when people go to college and go to university and get professional qualifications and pick up skills and so on, uh, they, they work, they pay a tax, uh, they become better people as well. Society becomes a better place. And I benefit from that. They're doing it for themselves, but I benefit. Because it's better to live in a nice society where people care and people understand and... Uh, also, there are more people working. So, governments re uh, intervene sometimes to control externalities. It's also the case that uh, markets can fail because of information. Information is wrong. Or information could be badly reported. So that it's misleading to investors or to, to the markets. So the government ensures that information that's used is accurate and that there is pressure on those putting, putting out the information to put out accurate information and to check the, the data, to check the type of analysis that was conducted before it was put into the public domain as information. could also be that markets can have undesirable outcomes. Uh, markets could produce products which uh, turn out to be injurious to, to people's health. Um, a manufacturer may make children's toys and it turns out that the children's toys could be dangerous to the children for whatever reason. They may contain substances that are dangerous or they may have uh, sharp edges or so the government regulate the type of goods to make sure the producers are producing items which are safe for the population. It's also the case that governments try to watch out for monopolies developing. We live in a capitalist system. A capitalist system means that it's based on competition. One company competing against the others to try and get our limited resource, our income, so the companies compete against each other and through competition we get better products and we get cheaper prices uh, the companies are competing to try and attract us to buy their product but some companies may become very good at this and start to in a sense kill off the other companies outcompete them and eventually they become larger and larger until it, eventually there is only one company in the market which is a monopoly. Now if there's only one company in the market the market is the one company then that company may charge a very high price. Now th if this is a good that we really want if it's a good that's essential for our well-being we have to pay a high price for it because there's only one producer. So governments try to maintain competition in the society and governments intervene to try and encourage competition. There could be a lack of international competitiveness and productivity. Uh, it's, it's important that the government 
constantly emphasise the need for competitiveness and higher productivity. So the government in a sense champions the cause for higher productivity and international competitiveness. Otherwise the country may end up importing a lot and exporting very little, which is bad for local industry because now imports will take the, the place of the, the local industry and, and also it's bad for the country because there is a deficit on the balance of payments. So by encouraging international competitiveness the government is trying to get long run uh, stability into the economy and long run prosperity. It tries to influence bank lending and investment as well, to try and get it to lend to worthwhile projects, get it to lend to industry perhaps who wants to invest in new innovative products or new machines or uh, new premises in a different area. Also trying to improve um, productivity within the population by getting industry to move to those areas and get people who were perhaps finding it difficult to get a job now getting them back into work and getting them to acquire skills so the banks uh, have, are encouraged to lend to projects such as these and sometimes the governments have schemes to underwrite the lending in case anything goes wrong the government will guarantee the bank that it will get back perhaps all of what it lent or, or a, a certain proportion of what it lent that's if something goes wrong. Training is also something that's uh, necessary. It's important that the population have got the skills and aptitudes and the abilities that are required by modern industry. If they haven't, industry will suffer, productivity will suffer, competitiveness will suffer. So the government through training programs and through college courses and so on tries to uh, enable the workforce to acquire the skills and the understanding that they require to become effective managers or engineers or accountants or whatever and try to uh, bolster up the industry and make it more competitive. It may also try uh, helping businesses with business startup schemes. Uh, sometimes people have a good idea for a business but they can't get the start of money, they can't get started in the business. They have a very good idea, it's, they've researched it, they know there's a market, uh, they know how to make the product and so on. So all of the preliminary work has been done, it's just they can't afford the premises or the machinery or they can't afford to get started and the government may have schemes to enable this to happen, to, to get them started. It also tries to encourage the infrastructure to uh, be developed in a way which is conducive to better productivity, more industrial activity, more employment and so on, greater prosperity. So it, it designs the infrastructure in a way, it could be the road system or the rail network or airports um, it could be even the infrastructure in terms of the provision for education or health care, uh, housing. Um, in many parts of our daily lives the government's involved in trying to plan the infrastructure to try and give us uh, a more uh, an easier life, a better life, but also to try and enable us to participate uh, in industry so that we have long-term prospects. And the government may do this through local governments, encouraging local governments to do or act in certain ways, or if the, the country has got states, it tries to help the, the state government to move in a certain way. And the government overall is trying to uh, maneuver the economy towards a better competitiveness. Uh, more ability to compete internationally and also to bring about new industry and more prosperity for local communities. 
Um, it also tries to redistribute wealth and it looks at the importance of growth in the economy. Um, over a period of time under capitalism some people become extremely rich and it appears that the richer they are the, the richer they get. So sometimes governments impose heavier tax on those people to try and redistribute welfare throughout society more fairly so that uh, everyone has a, a, an interest in the economy and in the government. Everyone has an interest because the field has been treated the same. But it also tries to encourage growth in the economy uh, in the sense of trying to um, generate more output, more industry, more participation rates amongst the, the workers. Uh, because it's th through growth that we get greater prosperity. We get more goods, more services, more jobs, more incomes, and we're generally just much better off. Now, let's look at monopoly in a little more detail. There are several classes of monopoly. This is when industry is reduced down to a single seller. So the industry is one company. Um, all the others have been out competed and they've they've gone away. They they've closed down. So there are several classes of monopoly. In this case, uh, it's when there's a single seller of a product uh, that is in demand. So there's a single seller. That's what we mean by monopoly. And because there's no competition, the market price will be higher than would otherwise be charged. Uh, monopolists may earn what's known as abnormal profits. Normal profits are when a company earns just enough profit to keep it in the industry. It's just getting enough to, to keep it in. If it gets less, it will close down. It's not worthwhile producing. It would get more if it had put the money into the bank or into an alternative investment. That's what we mean by normal profit. Abnormal profit, or sometimes called supernormal profit, is when a company gets over and above normal profits. So it gets extra to normal profits. And monopolists may earn this because they are the only producer of the product, they're the only company that makes this particular product in the whole country. They are monopolists. Output may be lower as well. Uh, monopolists may restrict output to force the price up. So there may be limited supplies of the product, uh, even though perhaps people want it, but they, they can't afford it. It's, it's at a higher price. So the monopolists charge more and produce less. And to do this compared to, let's say, a perfect competition or, if you like, more competitive models of competition. Now let's just, just move on with uh, monopoly to uh, investigate it a little, a little uh, in more depth. On the other hand, because of greater profits, because companies make greater profits, it may be that people working for the company have greater job security. Uh, the irony is that we want competition because we want cheaper goods and we want more of the good. But if we get a monopoly, the prices will be higher, we'll get fewer of the goods, the companies will make more profit, but the people working for the company may have greater job security. And there could also be the case that there's more research and development. Because the company is making more profits, perhaps abnormal profits, it can afford to invest in research and development. Companies that are just surviving, being very competitive, those companies don't have the resources to engage in research and development. Now that sort of 
concludes our, our talk on Monopoly. There are a couple of other points that I, I want to mention just however before we leave Monopoly. And one is that sometimes we say that Monopoly could be natural and therefore should not be punished. Uh, the government should not intervene to regulate uh, natural monopolies because sometimes for example uh, companies may supply water supply to households. There might be only one company supplying the water supply because it's not efficient for many companies to all put pipes in to deliver water to a single household. So some companies may be natural monopolies and and therefore uh, it's, it's right that they should continue in that mode but perhaps be regulated or watched by the government to ensure that, that, that they're not abusing their position. Some companies may uh, have the advantage of economies of size, economies of scale as they get bigger they become more efficient more specialized machine more specialized workers better discounts on purchasing better power to deal with the banks and so on so the companies uh, become monopolists again that would be in a sense a natural monopoly uh, but the issue then is for the government to watch the company to ensure that it's not abusing its position in the market now let's look at uh, a lack of international competitiveness and productivity. It's been on the screen now for a few moments, so let's uh, let's deal with that one. The government may intervene in the business sector because it's concerned about the competitiveness of companies in overseas markets. Uh, we want companies to be successful in overseas markets because we want to have more exports we want to have more prosperity and growth because of this globalization has led to more openness in international trade more cheap imports have damaged indigenous industries as well so we have more openness in international trade because of globalization and because of agreements between countries for trading but this may also lead to cheaper imports perhaps products being produced in countries where labor costs are very small, very low. And these cheap imports damage indigenous industry. Local industries can't compete. The manufacturing sector in particular may need encouragement and support to compete in international market in in, in international markets. Sorry. Um, manufacturing tends to be uh, the big employment sector. Uh, generally speaking in most economies it's the manufacturing sector that is gives most employment but it's important that the manufacturing sector is able to compete successfully overseas with innovative products with good prices with good reputation good marketing strategies and so on. So that's an issue that um, may bring the government into the economy. So the government comes in to intervene in the economy. So the government may also wish to influence industry to invest in high-tech solutions to increase long-term prosperity uh, in the country. Uh, high-tech solutions, the use of technology and computerization and so on is seen as important in promoting prosperity in the long run. The government may wish to influence the labor market in a way to improve labor relations and promote exports. So the government may also intervene in the economy to try and influence the labor market to uh, to be more flexible perhaps but also to enable the labor force to acquire the skills that are necessary to effectively compete in overseas markets. The government may intervene to regulate market operations to encourage investment and promote uh, quality and uh, national reputation in the marketplace. So the governments may try to intervene again to to try and get companies to invest in certain 
products or in certain, in certain machinery or in certain working practices. So it's to enable them to compete more effectively overseas and also to promote the quality of the product and hence the quality or the, the reputation of the business and of the country. So the government may intervene for that purpose. Next, let's look at bank lending and investment and see areas where the government may intervene in this case. Well, the government may regulate financial markets to avoid a uh, future financial crisis. Uh, we are aware of the major collapse in financial markets uh, in uh, 2008 and, and after that and this had a disastrous effect on employment and prosperity and on people's lives and therefore governments have taken uh, steps to intervene in banking practices and to ensure that banks are robust and operated properly. It may also wish to influence the type of lending that the banks are making. So for example it may not want to uh, lend entirely for housing or for property. It may want to lend for industry and production and it may, it may want the banks to diversify their portfolios and perhaps give more emphasis to industry. Perhaps encouraging lending for capital projects and small businesses uh, and away from short-term speculative lending. Um, trying to encourage the banks to help small businesses and medium-sized businesses and trying to get growth into the economy. So trying to persuade the banks and monitor the banks and it intervenes to try and nudge the banks to uh, be more responsible and to avoid the possibilities of crisis that we have seen in the last probably 10 years. Training. Well, the government oversees the development of uh, training and the delivery and the monitoring and the quality of education as well. So the government tends to have a, a high profile in this area. It tries to make sure that education programs are good quality and uh, they are also focused on delivering uh, skills and competencies that are required in today's world. Um, the world today is becoming increasingly more sophisticated and complex and it's important that the population should be equipped to deal with this complexity and sophistication. So the government initiates training programs and qualifications and uh, encourages trainers and training organizations and educational institutions to try and move them to providing products, education products, which are relevant in today's world. It may intervene uh, to influence the direction of these programs and meet current and future market needs in the labour market. So the government tries to figure out what's happening or what's required in the labour market and then tries to get education and training uh, to, to meet those needs. There is a need for more technological skills in the labour market and the government may regulate the education and training sectors to meet that need. So the government knows the importance of technology and the importance of technological training. So it, it tries to give incentives to education, um, educational institutions, to colleges, universities and so on. It tries to uh, manoeuvre them to into a position where they will prov uh, provide more training of this type and thereby equip the population to benefit from these technological breakthroughs, make the country more competitive and enhance the reputation of the country. 
Business startups, well, <coughs> with business startups, the governments may intervene to regulate parts of business practices so as to encourage business startups. Uh, business startups are vital because from business startups we get uh, industry in the future and going on to become perhaps larger and more important industry in the future. So business startups are seen as essential for the prosperity of the country, the long run prosperity of the country. Unfortunately, most business startups seem to fail, fail at the early stages, but they may fail for particular reasons, for example a shortage of capital or perhaps the the entrepreneurs who are bringing forward the business do not have the right business skills or they don't have mentoring or the proper support. So the government tries to intervene to create a climate of support for small businesses to try and uh, promote them and try to get them to survive and grow they will also become major employers in the economy uh, they, because of their size and experience they're probably more flexible they may be more up to, to date with the current requirements in terms of technology um, but the chances are they will, be, they will grow into larger and more sophisticated organizations in the future if they do develop so therefore the governments intervene to try and uh, promote this type of development. There are all sorts of uh, ways, for example providing seed capital, in other words capital to get it started, just to get the the whole project moving. Uh, the government tries to reduce bureaucracy because bureaucracy takes time for the entrepreneurs to fill out forms and uh, go to attend meetings and uh, business presentations of the ideas and sales pitches and but sometimes it may be better for the entrepreneur just to focus on getting the business running cut through the bureaucracy but it can also reduce taxation for startups to give the startups more incentive to get going so that they're not taxed and it may also help with training and recruitment which is important Now the infrastructure, well the government may wish to influence the type and amount of various forms of in infrastructure. Infrastructure may be, as I said earlier, railways, roads, airports, schools, colleges, hospitals, clinics and so on and so on. So these are all quite essential uh, expenditures in the economy because we need infrastructure, we need good roads for communications purposes and to move goods around the roads. We need good airports for international uh, contacts but also we need airports to make urgent deliveries of goods and have imports. And We need schools and colleges to equip the population to be able to work in technologically advanced industries and compete with companies overseas. We also need hospitals, of course, to, in a sense, maintain the workforce. The hospitals are, uh, they provide a valuable service in ensuring the health of the workforce. Um, but infrastructure is a very wide term and it's the government who tries to plan out and deliver the infrastructure. Uh, redistribution and welfare and growth. Well redistribution and welfare and growth it's it's felt to be the case that the government may be needed to uh, redistribute income for various reasons. Uh, to create a more balanced society with less so social stress. If we have a few very very rich people and a lot of people very poor there will be stress in that society. There will be political agitation and political problems and there will be a, a lot of issues in the society which will hold that society back. So the government tries to redistribute wealth from the rich to the poor. It also uh, 
encourage participation in the labour force. If uh, if there's a more balanced society and if, if people feel they're all in this together, they may have a better spirit of working together. Uh, so if they feel that they're getting more rewards for their efforts and they're not just making some people very rich while they remain poor, if they feel that they're getting more reward, they will be more interested in participating. However, of course, care must be taken to avoid disincentives. If we uh, take away from the rich, the rich will have a disincentive. In fact, the rich may move country and take their money with them, which will leave the country a lot poorer. Or if, uh, if the government taxes the rich, the rich may stop working. They've already got enough money to to live, so why should they work? So they, they will stop. And that means this great talent will be lost. So the government has to be careful to avoid disincentives. Likewise, the government may wish to encourage economic growth and generate higher standards of living. Economic growth is what enables us to have more over time. There is a big debate about growth and the state of the climate and of the the green the green arguments that are put forward. Uh, we we have experienced climatic change. I think most people would agree now that the case has been made. There are issues with the climate, and we want more economic growth. But more economic growth means greater demands on the planet. More economic growth means more pollution. More resources are required. So there's a tension between what we want in the long run, which is better lives, better houses, better cars, better communication systems, better travel and so on. That's what we want, but on the other hand we are destroying the planet. So there is quite a big debate there, and the government needs to uh, try to find a balance in this one, so that we do not destroy the planet. This is the only planet we've got, whilst at the same time uh, addressing our needs, as they've almost become, for having more products and a higher standard of living in the future. So in, in this uh, video we've looked at quite a lot of ideas associated with why governments get involved in the economy, why governments attempt to regulate the economy. Uh, it's quite a wide-ranging discussion and it's quite a long one as well as you can see. It's well worthwhile going back over this and uh, just taking the topics. Note the, the slide number on the bottom right. Uh, take a topic and note the slide number and do your revision by making notes of the slides plus add additional reading you can find um, in, in the classes and make your own set of notes as to why governments should intervene in the economy. Why should governments try to regulate the economy? The essential points are covered in this video but that's all I'm going to do uh, for a moment so Let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching.